Gabriel, Gabriel Manga, and um, he is, uh, did anyone, did you check out Lore, you saw some of the videos? Okay, I'm going to quickly read you a very brief bio on Gabriel, and then I'm going to tell you why I'm really happy to see him. So, um, Gabriel works with Bamyan, Bamyan? Bamyan. Bamyan Media on business development and communications. Um, during their work in Egypt, Bamyan created and executed Egypt's first educational reality TV show <coughs> for and about young Egyptian entrepreneurs. He has previously worked around sustainable job creation models in Bogota, Colombia, and for Ashoka Arab World. Gabriel holds a Bachelor of Arts in Middle East and North African Studies from the University of Michigan and studied pop culture and media in the Arab world with the School for International Training in Tunisia. So really, really interesting background um, already. Um, and I just, I think, you know, in the interest of having like, a well-rounded group of speakers and speakers coming from a variety of perspectives, I, mean, I just like, um, for one thing, that Gabrielle is young um, and also like pretty freshly out of school, like three and a half years we were just yeah. um, talking. So, you know, in some ways he's in your, you know, he's, he's like one step ahead of you in terms of like chronology of a career or a path or whatever you want to do in the world. Um, They're all going to have master's degrees. Right, okay, so he's a step behind you and then a step ahead of you, so he's like right exactly where you are. <laughs> Is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then the other thing that I thought was appealing was that we hear from, just because we're based here in New York City and we like to have our speakers live, um, we hear about a lot of you know, domestic initiatives or things that are sort of American centric, um, uh, which is fine, but Gabriel's bringing a perspective from um, Egypt, um, and I think that's, that's going to be really interesting for a lot of us. And, Please ask questions. I think the style of this presentation is going to be pretty informal, and so it's meant to really be a discussion and a back and forth and a QA. and a and um, I'm going to let him take it away. Cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll stand in front for now. Um, I'm Gabriel. Nice to meet you all. Are you guys the ones that did the like plates, dinner, design stuff? I saw them the other day. It's pretty, yeah. pretty cool. Impressive. I can't do that. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so as Skylar was saying, uh, I just moved back here from Cairo. Um, I was living there for about three and a half years. I moved out there about a month after I graduated from university. And then six months later, the revolution happened and it became an even more interesting place to live. Um, and sort of ended up there ever since. And so, should I talk about how I ended up working? So basically, I now work for this NGO slash media, pro media production company slash social enterprise, whatever you want to call these things now. I don't like calling it an NGO because I'd rather us, you know, get away from this model of just making donors and all of this. Um, and so I moved to Egypt and, like I said, I worked for Ashoka internship and turned into a job and then was leaving them and thought I was leaving Egypt and was planning my goodbye party and a friend said hey I can't make it but you know I hear that you're looking for work and there's these people here making a reality TV show about entrepreneurs so I've been working in the entrepreneur social entrepreneur sector in Egypt for a year and a half at that point and I really like reality TV um, I was pretty obsessed with the Jersey Shore when it came out. Um, <laughs> and so I said, yeah, that sounds good, you know, let's, let's meet. And so I took the founder of Bambi Media out to dinner, Anna Elliott, who you guys should Google. She's really impressive. She's 29. She's done two reality TV shows in the Middle East region. Um, so I took her out to dinner, and she didn't know this, but I convinced her to hire me. Um, <laughs> Uh, I guess the food is good, um, and yeah, so then two years later we ended up debuting this TV show. Um, so I'll show you a clip for now, and then I can talk about the process of it. So I'm going to warn you, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty cheesy, um, but it's fun. There's subtitles, you don't need to understand Arabic. Didn't what? Are you what? Possible to take a lesson within the fuck of the handle of the light. Wash, get 
اخترنا 14 رائد اعمال عشان يشاركوا في المشروع ويحولوا احلامهم لحقيقه. كلهم هيتنافسوا على الجائزه الكبيره اللي هتساعدهم ينفذوا مشروعهم. مشروع الحمد لله انا متنبؤ، قالي تنبؤ حلو جدا. في المشروع ده انا نفسي اشتغل بعد ما اعمل كل اسبوع هيبقى في تحدي اصعب من قبل. المهم النهارده هنعدل في التدريب في التدريب طبعا هنعدل ازاي هيساعدها ازاي تسوق؟ الابداع والتخطيط احسن ساعدهم باحسن تنظيم لازم يفكروا ويتصرفوا ويلاقوا حلول لمشاكل عمرهم ما كانوا يتخيلوا انها هتعملها عايزين كهرباء الراجل مش هيمشي اي حاجه غير لما ياخد في المساعده ايه ناشفين مين؟ مين هيستحمل ومين هيستسلم؟ الطريق طويل وبندور على اللي يقدر يكمله في الاخر. انا هكون عشان تبقى قلبت في الحياه. انا مش عشان مش مش عندي عيش كتير جدا. عندنا بنايا جديده. انا اللي حضرتك هتاخد كله. يوم واحد بس موجودين. واللي مش هيعرف يثبت نفسه قدام لجنه التحكيم. So that's that's our TV show. Uh, we're about five episodes in. Our last episode got delayed because there were we have the channel we're on shows a lot of news and there were big protests and stuff like that on the anniversary of the revolution, and so we got bumped off because there were more important things happening than a reality TV show. Um, by watching this, you might think to yourself, hey, that looks a lot like The Apprentice. Um, and that's because it does. Um, so the key sort of in making the show is how can we have something that's both really entertaining, um, really empowering, and really educational. If you talk about, to use more jargon, uh, entertainment, empowerment, enablement. So we want someone to watch the show that has no interest in entrepreneurship, that couldn't care less about you know, empowering the youth of Egypt and job creation and, you know, all this different stuff and just someone who wants to be entertained and kind of veg out for an hour. Um, Can you repeat those entertainment, empowerment, and... What was it? Entertainment, empowerment, enablement. So, the entertainment factor. So people come, they watch, say, man, this is a really cool show. Um, the network actually forced us to put on a bunch of celebrities, which we weren't that happy about because it makes really awkward moments because they don't have any expertise in entrepreneurship. Um, so they, Can you give just, us an example? That's just uh, I'll try and queue it up towards the end. But yeah, so every episode, yeah, so I'm going to badmouth the channel because they treated us really poorly. Um, so they basically said, you know, like this is a new thing in Egypt. We're not sure it's going to work. Why don't you throw, I don't know, the equivalent of like if, I don't know, like uh, David Beckham, or he could, he's even an entrepreneur. Someone who's, Ashton could, he know. Who's, 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 like, who's like a really, Paris Hilton, okay? So every episode, someone like her comes on and gives the team like a pep talk, and it's really awkward, and everyone's just kind of like, why is this person here? Um, so, so there's that element, and the, you know, the show is really entertaining, and there's drama, and you find yourself like irrationally attached to different characters, you're like, no, you know, like, I really want Fodwa to win, and then she gets voted off, and then you get really sad, but then the next week. Um, and so, we, that's the key. To making the TV show we want our message to get out to as many people as possible. You know, Egypt has a population of now probably 85 million. People there watch an average of three hours of TV a day. Um, there's TVs absolutely everywhere. Um, the media market is gigantic. It's a billion dollar industry. All the heavy hitters from multinational corporations are operating in the system. So you have to please all of that. But then we sort of try and, you know, we say empowerment. So there's the key messaging of the TV show itself. And so to make the show, we didn't just come in with this format um, that we did in Afghanistan before I was with Bamian, but that's the first place we did it, um, which was actually easier because it was the sweet spot when not much was going on there. And the media market's much smaller. There's not as many Afghan-produced shows. So everyone was just kind of like, yeah, let's do this. Go for it. In Egypt, it took a lot more time. Um, there was the research that goes into it. You know, we needed to find out what are the issues in Egypt that we need to address. Is it that there's lack of finance? Is it that 
um, there's not enough, you know, workshops and education about it? Is it that, um, you know, people aren't being told that this is a viable, uh, you know, thing for them to do? What's the viewpoint on entrepreneurship? If you told your parents, hey, I'm going to be an entrepreneur, what would they say to you? The answer is probably, you know, you're dumb. Um, but is that the case? Often, you know, it's not, it's viewed as a very unstable job, you know, you should be, otherwise, you know, you should be a doctor or an engineer, those are the two big ones, um, but in the case of a country like Egypt, a lot of kids who get doctor and engineering degrees, there's no jobs for them, or ones that won't let them pay the bills. So, we do a lot of research first to figure out what is it that our show needs to be addressing. Um, in Egypt, one of the biggest things that we found was that the entrepreneurship sector after the revolution is actually somewhat booming compared to before. There's a ton of money rolling in, there's startup weekends, there's incubators. AUC, the American University of Cairo, has a new incubator within its university. If you go to the posh neighborhoods of Cairo, there's a new restaurant and boutique opening up every week. You would have no idea there's an economic crisis, no idea you know, that the numbers are pretty staggering, something that 80% of the unemployed are youth. Um, unemployment rate's pretty skyrocketing, though you need to create an insane millions of jobs before. So what we found, though, is that even though entrepreneurship was booming, it was very limited to this elite class. Often, you know, English speaking, went to the American university or went to a university abroad. Um, families come from money, et cetera, et cetera. So one of our key messaging, how do we get our message out to the vast majority of the population who are not like that. Um, the way the ad firms use that there, and it's, I don't like to say it, but they have A, B, C, and D class. And so the A class is the elite, and the very small, and then there's a B, which is a dwindling middle class, and then there's a sort of lower middle class to lower class that we really <coughs> wanted to address. Um, so the purposely the show, the cast we did uh, casting for about three months, we did a casting session every government in Egypt. It's like the equivalent if we went to every U.S. state and had an individual session. We team up with local organizations, um, NGOs, uh, youth centers, uh, local universities, local schools, and say, hey, can you help us get the message out? We're, you know, anyone who has an idea of being an entrepreneur, how can we get in touch with them? Come out, give your pitch into the camera, and we sort of, we had over, you know, a thousand applicants and narrowed that down to 14. We purposely, you know, for TV, some of them, if their idea was a little weaker than someone's, but they were a little, had a little more character, one with more characters getting on the show. Um, and purposely, you know, different religious backgrounds, Christian, Muslim, from different parts of Egypt, from the Sinai, from the Delta, from Upper Egypt, um, Alexandria, the coast, women, men, uh, different socioeconomic backgrounds, but we definitely wanted to make sure that it was a representation of everyone going on. Um, and then, so, so that's the empowering message. We want people to see the show, say to themselves, hey, like, I have an idea to start a business. I have, a, in fact, I have a better idea than this asshole on TV. Why am I not that person? And so that's something, an emotion we actually want to drive. So we want people to say, oh, full show. Oh wait, I can do this. And then the key is when they say that, they're often thinking to themselves, okay, how do I do this? So by watching the show, we purposely embed stuff about you know how to register your business, how to build a team, um, how to manage a team, business planning, event management, um, you know, managing your funds, all of this, all the sort of elements that go into entrepreneurship. But the even bigger part that we wanted to do is really showcase the work, and the, there's lots of being done on the ground already in Egypt of, about the entrepreneurship sector and about social entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship itself. I'm not going to get into the definitions of these right now because I'll talk for another hour. Um, but, so you know, there's already incubators on the ground, there's already NGOs doing tons of work uh, in outreach, um, trying to get young people involved. There's even you know government programs that have loans available for first-time entrepreneurs. You know they even have you know tons of curriculum to give out to people. They've established a one-stop shop where you can just go and that day register your business, which cuts through a lot of the red tape that Egypt's pretty notorious for. 
the problem is that a lot of this information was, you know, stuck in this one field or one group of this sort of clique of entrepreneurs. And so through the show, you know, the end of the show, we show, we, you know, say these are our partners, you know, and they, you know, they've got their logos, they're featured throughout the show, <coughs> working out in different spaces, and then, you know, we have tickers that say, hey, for more info, go to elmashrua.tv, which is our website, um, go to facebook.com slash elmashrua, and from there, we can take them and drive more traffic to these organizations that are already doing great work. It's just part of the issues that nobody knows about them. And so we were able to leverage a lot of that. You know, we had a massive social media campaign, which I was partially in charge of, so we have over half a million Facebook fans, whatever that means. Uh, but it does give us a lot of leverage to push messaging. You know, when one of our partners, an NGO called Nafta Makrusa, who works around social entrepreneurs, they incubate about five a year from Egypt. They you know, aren't getting necessarily as many people applying from different backgrounds as they should be. And it's not their fault, they just, you know, they're an NGO. They're struggling for money and communications just like every NGO is. Um, and, but what we can do with this big fan base and with TV is really push their content to a really large audience. And so that is one of the biggest parts of the show, is that we really wanted it to be something that you know, this show is not going to, you know, fundamentally change Egypt. This show is not going to change all of Egypt's problems. This show is not going to be the thing that employs millions of young people. What we wanted to do is sort of spark a greater conversation about entrepreneurship and about sort of the way the economy in Egypt will be moving. Um, you know, we want people to discuss, hey, why is it that these, you know, it's hard for me to get a loan at a bank? Why is it that you know, when I do take, if I do get a loan and I go bankrupt, I go to jail. It's part of the law. Um, and so we want very much dialogue to be going on amongst the sort of greater society. That's a little intimidating. Yeah, is it? Um, <laughs> For an entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah, um, so that's definitely a hindrance. Um, of course, if you can pay the right person, you might not be going okay. to jail. Um, so, not, not to say that things are hugely corrupt there. But. So, Gabrielle, I have a question. Yeah, that thing goes. A few yeah. questions, but I wanted to get, um, could you give us a little context, because I have no idea what's on TV in Egypt okay. at the moment. Like, I don't yeah. know how radical is this compared to, or, like, what, like, when this aired, or yeah. when this premiered, or whatever, like, what was the reaction, and does it feel like a breath of fresh air? Does it feel like dangerously radical like what what kind of where does it fall on the spectrum so it's a mix so uh, egyptian tv right now there's this sort of what it's famous for which is soap operas which is a sort of global phenomenon that's not unique to egypt it's not unique to the u.s south america everywhere you go there are soap operas people love them they laugh they cry um they wonder why people backstab them um which is they have a lot of that in our show too um but yeah exactly so that's the sort of bread and butter of egyptian tv during ramadan um, which is the 40 month or about month long period. Mm -hmm. Now it's during the summer, they'll have the big thing is the soap opera's debut and they go every night. So everyone tunes in, things what? are shut down. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's actually our goal for next year's air during Ramadan. Um, but. Uh, Sorry, I have this image of people like being like so holy. Like yeah. what, you would just like, I don't want to taint my body with food. Or no, my this, mind is after you, this is after you eat, you've eaten for like three hours okay, um, at the end of the day. Everything's okay uh, right after. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's cool, it's fine. Um, so, yeah. so yeah, so there's soap operas, and now the biggest thing there is X Factor and Arab Idol and The Voice. Um, they're absolutely massive TV shows. They're, they're everywhere, they're taking over Bridges, advertising it, um, you know, things kind of shut down at times. And then the big, what, so right after that, the biggest show for a while was uh, Open Dynamic, which is the equivalent of The Daily Show there. Fast and I don't know if you've heard of him. It's been like the New York Times, he's this darling of Western media and from, from Egypt. And, he, and he's really entertaining and he is a behemoth. He started from on YouTube and completely flipped the media industry on its head. 
Um, and he was sort of a reference point for us for a decent amount of time and saying, hey, like you can try new things, and they work. Um, in terms of how revolutionary idea it was, you know, w when we'd show the show to people, everyone kind of got it. You know, they'd say, oh, it's like, you know, it's kind of like The Apprentice, it's a reality TV show, it's a competition, there's kids, yeah. etc. And so they'd say, okay, cool idea, nice. Um, the key for us really is how we kept the integrity of it and kept mm -hmm. it um, to, to have educational elements mm -hmm. and to be empowering. Like I said, having celebrities forced upon us. Right. Um, or, you know, I can get into the process of how the show got made, actually. Mm -hmm. So, we, Wait, we had a question. Can okay, yeah. Is your question relevant? Yeah, well, I'm just curious because you were talking about, um, like, the goals that happen from the show, and I just, I like <coughs> what you said, like, there's, you know, half a million Facebook fans, whatever that means. I actually did something extremely similar in Afghanistan before coming to DSI, mm -hmm. and one of the reasons I came back to school is I felt like these shows cost, I, I don't know what your show costs, yeah. but the things we would produce would cost millions of dollars. Yeah. It was the sort of, like you're talking about the funding model where an international donor gives money and mm -hmm. we would produce these shows. And I felt like there was no way to gauge the success. I mean, even if in Afghanistan we could, you know, look at the ratings and we could kind of figure out certain indicators, but to me a lot of them felt very sort of false or very, um, <coughs> like, in a short time span, obviously the change that you're looking to see is a lot longer with some of these campaigns. And so I'm curious as to how you measure success beyond just sort of Facebook likes and ratings and sort of, okay, this is, you know, the spirit of, of the story. Like, are you able to do that? And, and how, does that, how does that correlate with funding? Absolutely. So uh, I'll answer in two parts. Mm -hmm. um, I'll do the funding part after. Yeah, so um, but so for the show itself, we do actually we're actually running a fairly big monitoring evaluation um, session right now because the show is airing as we speak, and so we have a base of about two thousand people, and so it's a thousand control, a thousand um, people that we have watched the show, and so we have a pretty thorough uh, set of questions. Mind you, monitoring evaluation can be hugely flawed no matter what, mm -hmm. um, but we are looking for things you know like. What is your perception of entrepreneurship after watching the show? And so asking people that, both that do watch the show or don't watch the show, um, have you started having more conversations about this? Do you feel that entrepreneurship is a viable avenue? Um, do you feel that you have more knowledge about where to go for resources about entrepreneurship? Um, and so those are what some of the key things we did. The other, one of the other big things that we've done is, I've talked, you know, talked about the partners, is we are keeping tabs with them on, you know, how how is your traffic increased? You know, with Ashoka, for instance, we probably when I was there got about a hundred applicants a year if if we did well, and so we'd like to see that number possibly double. Or with the incubators, what demographics are you seeing people coming from? More? Is it the same people who went to the American University, or is it more people coming from Anshams University and Cairo University, and from outside of Cairo, and from the Delta, and these different regions where we are purposely targeted. Mm -hmm. um, Facebook, yeah, I don't put that much, uh, you know, I wouldn't put that much weight on the amount of likes because, you know, we pay for advertising and Egypt has a pretty, as I say, cheap click rate in that people say they like something and not necessarily be that disconcerting about it. Um, but at the same time, one of the best things that Facebook let us do is really target demographics. Um, you could say we want people from Alexandria, or you know we want to get people from Upper Egypt. We want to get people from the Sinai, and it really, really lets you get into that, and it and it works. So that that is one of the benefits. From a funding standpoint, the monitoring evaluation is a really crucial thing that we're doing right now because if we can come up, come to funders next time and say, listen, we know we get results. You know, we're not just some wishy-washy feel-good story. You know about making a TV show in the developing world, and you know these foreigners coming in, um, and we can actually say that we got Im you know impact and results. It, it's tremendous. We'll be able to get you know way more than we would be able to otherwise. And that 
is impact and results enough to say like three of the entrepreneurs on the show actually have viable businesses? We created three jobs for people who are now doing something, or do they need to see a hundred extra people came into a small business development center and fifty more went to an incubator? You know, it's a mix. We, you know, from our donors right now, we have a pretty <coughs> uh, lenient standpoint. Um, we were funded by USAID <coughs> startup in, in Egypt, um, which is both a gift and a curse. Um, I don't know if people here have worked with USA before, but they gave us a bunch of money and it was great and helped us stay on our feet for a long time. Um, but in a country like Egypt that was going through the sort of upheaval and the other USA ID NGOs are getting shut down, it also shut a lot of doors for us in that, you know, there are people that would say, you know, we're not working with you, period. Um, but with USAID, yeah, you know, we have the reports we file for them and stuff like that. We have our success stories, but they, at this point, tend to not need as many solid numbers like that. Eventually, we will have that. Um, at, and, you know, at this point as well, the idea is still pretty sexy to people, and so a lot of donors will sort of hear that and say, oh, cool, yeah. And then at least be wonderstruck enough to give us a little bit of money before who knows the truth. <laughs> I think I think I think it'll be a success, and that everyone from the show is definitely going to be starting their business. So that's fourteen entrepreneurs. To me, if that's it, then it's not necessarily a success. Like I want the show to have a far greater impact. Like I said, to me, what's much more important is disseminating the information about what's on the ground in terms of these other NGOs, these local NGOs, these local incubators, these local initiatives and getting more traffic to them, but then also looking at what are the gaps in the entrepreneurship sector in Egypt. Mm -hmm. You know, there's not, I can tell you right now, there's not enough cap, there's not enough funding. Mm -hmm. There's n not enough investors <coughs> willing to take chances on, on kids with entrepreneurial ideas. And that's something that in the show gets addressed. Mm -hmm. And the hope is that when people watch that show and when, you know, this will be something that people start talking about. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, maybe the issue is not that there's not enough ideas, or that people aren't empowered to start the business. Maybe it's that they say they want to, and no one's there to give them a business loan or be an angel investor. Um, is there a way that someone can contact them through like your site? Like you said, there were 14 mm -hmm. of the character. Yeah. So is there a way like to personally be like, you're watching the show, you're an angel investor, you're mm -hmm. like totally down for the mm -hmm. cause, and then you can. Mm -hmm. Like Kiva.org. Yeah, yeah. So, so this gets into something else that we wish we could have done, but it's hard in Egypt, which is crowdfunding um, mm -hmm. for them. Uh, it's hard for a myriad of reasons. PayPal doesn't exist in Egypt. Um, but the way to get in contact with them right now is we're pretty open on the site and saying, you know, if you want to get in contact with anyone, you know, email us <coughs> at info at El Mashrua. Or we list, you know, we have a pretty active social media campaign and all the contestants are out there on Twitter and Facebook, and their info is listed on the website under their profiles. So, you know, people, yeah, people have been getting in contact with them directly, and saying, hey, what's up? Like, you have a good idea. <laughs> you should, we should talk, so. And were there any particular sectors that, that are really needed? Mm. Um, like health, or like, I don't, I, you know, in terms of entrepreneurship. Um, it, it's a mixed bag. I will say, that that's actually a good question, because right now the big thing there, and when you go to Startup Week in Cairo and Alexandria and all of these things, and when everyone's looking at this, it's all tech, 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 tech. Kids building apps, you know, kids, you know, I have this new software program, blah, blah, blah. It's great, right? And there can, and it can be really good, but it can get frustrating, and this is one of the things that we talked about when you're at Startup Week in Cairo and the people that are getting the most you know, applause is someone who built an app that helps you navigate the biggest mall in Egypt. <laughs> and so just like, well, that one isn't going to employ many people. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. yeah, so one that's not going to employ many people. And then two isn't really helping anyone. You know, the argument could be made, well, then more business gets done, blah, blah, but come on, it's, it's not bullshit around. That's not going <laughs> to help that many people. Here. So one of the things that we purposely tried to do is stay away from the tech heavy entrepreneurs. We wanted people that were um, doing stuff that was at least a little more hands on. Um, that is to say, the tech sector is a place, huge place of growth. There's great tech entrepreneurs in Egypt, but 
we didn't think that they were already getting the lion's share of the publicity and the funds mm -hmm. in the entrepreneurship sector mm -hmm. and not necessarily creating the type of job growth. How do you protect the concept contestants' ideas and their businesses mm -hmm. since they're going on public TV that someone doesn't copy that in another place and then their business will grow? That's, that's, a, that's also, I, get to, I sound like it's such a cliche speaker. That's a really good question. Um, but that, you know, that was a huge part of the casting in that we had people saying, hey, I want to be a contestant on your show, but what if you just steal my idea? At the same time, I mean, that's kind of the risk of an entrepreneur anywhere. You know, and the truth is, most of the great entrepreneurial ideas, it's not like nobody thought of it before. You know, it's more so about executing. And so, one of the biggest things we do is, you know, these people have their ideas out, the contestants have their ideas out there, and they're only filming with us for a month. And the show's not live. So, by the time the show airs and someone wants to steal their idea, in theory, the contestants should be out there executing their idea already. So, there's no, I mean, there's, the only safeguard is their own action. Um, and most of their ideas, you know, there's innovations in their ideas, but once again, it's not like nobody ever thought of, you know, to build Kickstarter. Can you give some examples of some of their ideas? Yeah. Um, so, some are fairly basic, and one girl, she does a hand-painted t-shirt company. One guy uh, has an e-learning company that he's starting. Another girl is trying to start up a biogas um, business, what else? One girl is trying to start a women's empowerment dance studio. Uh, one, I think, what else? One guy's starting an olive oil plant in the Sinai. So it's it's a whole mix of tech and low tech and different demographics. One guy runs a beanbag company. Um, so it's it's a whole mix. Yeah. What does the winner of the competition get? Because just that I got from watching the videos, it's kind of a mixture of the show Shark Tank, where mm -hmm. you have multiple entrepreneurs that are giving feedback, they're willing to invest, but you also have kind of the Donald Trump aspect yeah. of mm -hmm. elimination, competition to weed out, weed out probably isn't the right word, but to get a winner. Yeah. And so, so yeah, so the grand prize winner got 350,000 Egyptian pounds, which is about $50,000 of investment in their business. Um, and the way the show is structured is that it, they're sort of not focusing as much on their own business for the first 12 episodes. They're focusing on getting mentoring, training, and doing these challenges that test their entrepreneurial abilities that they, in theory, are learning. Then, for the final two episodes, you see them go back and apply what they've learned to their business and starting it. And then the investors sort of do this and then at the end they pitch and the two judges plus the guest judge um, decide who the winner is. With that said, one of the biggest things for our show is that we didn't want to have this shame failure element to it. We wanted everyone who, to come on, who came on the show to feel like they were a winner and for people who watch the show to feel like we weren't dropping them through a trap door never to be seen again. Um, so everyone who comes on the show, at minimum, uh, we tailor make a package for them. So one of the first people voted off was a tech entrepreneur. And one of the things that we did was we set him up with a tech incubator. In Cairo, we, you know, he got, aside from, Samsung was a sponsor, so they got new computer, new phone, all that stuff. But also, you know, depending on who they are, if they need money, we have money to give them. If they need mentoring, training, incubation, stuff like that, that was what their prize was. So everyone who comes on the show gets something. And it, it even comes down to what the guy, what um, Hisham Gamal, who's a software entrepreneur, who's one of the head judges, when they get voted on the show, they don't say you're fired, they say your dream will continue, just not with us. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> we, we, we like to keep it very lovey-dovey and you know, all of that. And so we, because that was a big thing, you know, there haven't been competitions point. like this. Mm -hmm in Egypt before and one of the big concerns is, you know, you know, that we're gonna mess with these people's lives and ruin them. Mm -hmm. and I don't want to do that to anyone. Mm -hmm. So so that was yeah, one of the things that we ended up doing. Um, I can talk a little bit about how the show actually got made, because that's to me what that's what we spent the bulk of the time doing. We spent basically a year and six months, year and a half, maybe more, just trying to get the show off the ground. Um, and it was a real, real struggle. 
You mean shopping it around? And shopping it around, trying to get sponsors, mm -hmm. trying to get partners, all stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sort of doing that again now mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for South America. Mm -hmm. um, we, so we got to Egypt and all this sort of ecosystem partners, NGOs, Google, um, incubators, everyone like that, when you tell them the idea, everyone's just kind of like, yeah, let's do this. Yeah, cool, fuck yeah. And nobody <laughs> says no. But they don't have money to make a TV show. So they're sort of step one. We work with them, like I said, we do the research, we do in-depth you know, conversations, we took everyone out to a farm, and do you, do you know who Rio's Partners is? Mm -hmm. um, yes? No. Yes. Yes. Are you guys going to uh, Zaid's talk at New School? You guys should. This is next week? Or? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we brought him in, we did a whole you know, hippie change lab out on a farm. Everyone talked about what the needs of Egypt were. Everyone talked about what they want to see on a TV show, what different challenges there should be. And so it was a big co-creation process. And that was wonderful, and we left it feeling on top of the world. <laughs> then we came back to reality and had to deal with the people that would be allowing us to show this, by buying the show from us to put on TV and paying us as sponsors. And so that's where things really took a long time. Um, because we we're not only were we doing a new TV show with an educational aspect to it that was around TV, but we also attempted to do a new business model for making TV that ended up kind of blowing up in our faces at one point. So the way TV tradition gets made is you have a TV show, you sell it to the channel, the channel makes the money back by selling to advertisers. In Egypt, everyone kept coming, you know, it was a catch-22. All the channels said to us, well, why don't you go out and get us some sponsors that come talk to us? And then the sponsors say, well, why, why don't you go out and get us a channel, and then we'll talk to you. So just, we're sitting there just kind of saying, well, I don't know what to do. So what we did is we ended up teaming up with a global ad firm called J. Walter Thompson, um, JWT. And the, right now, one of the big things that TV channels are realizing is that people watch a lot of TV online, and even when people watch TV, you know, television the traditional way, they're muting the commercials. So the key is, how do we get commercials into the show itself, beyond just the basic, you know, this person is drinking Pepsi. Um, so we teamed up with them, and they had a new entertainment branch um, to do exactly that. And we basically told them, hey, if you get us the money for production and get us a TV channel, you guys can have 50% of all the revenue. And they said, great. We worked together for about four months, five months, six months. And they basically screwed themselves over. Because we went out, we'd be out at pitch meetings, and they are asking for, you know, our show costs about a million dollars to make. They're asking for two million, three million dollars per sponsor. Which, you know, if you're sponsoring X Factor or Air Vital or Proven show, that's pretty, you know, lowest common denominator, people like singing. Um, it's, you can ask for that kind of money. But for us, everyone just kind of was insulted. And so I said, who are you guys coming in here? Are they American? JBT? No, they're Egyptian. Okay. Um, well, they're international. They are, but they have their, it was their, lo their local office. Yeah. And this is with people that they represent. So, you know, mm -hmm. Vodafone, mm -hmm. um, the biggest telecom in Egypt, going in there and kind of not necessarily doing things correctly. Samsung. Uh, Pepsi, Coca-Cola, Damon, people like that. And so basically they shot for the moon and it didn't work out. So I ended up splitting from them. And you know, and basically also what happened is TV channels don't like what they're trying to do because it cuts out their basic revenue model. Yeah. And so basically what they'd say to us is, well, you're trying to get sponsors on your, on your own. You're running a commercial. You have to pay us to air this on our TV channel, which wasn't going to fly. So, and also the media industry uh, here as well is filled with a lot of sharks and people that are trying to get a buck. So what we ended up doing is a hybrid model. We ended up getting, so splitting JBT, ended up getting Samsung as an initial sponsor. Um, and they give us a decent chunk of change to do, for them to be the official sponsor. They get the branding on everything. They get their, they call organic brand integration. Um, <laughs> Which was easy for us in that the kids are already using cell phones the entire TV show and it's not that hard to have that there. Samsung just needed to be a Samsung cell phone and a Samsung computer and all of that and make sure that there are no iPhones, iPhones on set. Um, 
which is a really big hassle because yeah. you end up feeling what they end up feeling like they're the ones making the TV show, um, awesome. which is annoying. Um, but you know, God bless them for giving us the money. Uh, and so we ended up doing the traditional model of working with a TV channel. TV channel paid us, um, and then integrating Samsung into that, and then the TV channel selling some more sponsors. But it was a whole, you know, I'd say the hardest part of the journey in making a TV show is really keeping the integrity of the show. In that, you know, and I can't blame a TV executive for wanting to go with something that's a proven winner and having, you know, as much drama, celebrities, and product placement, and stuff like that. You know, because they're out to make money. It's a purely business venture for them. Um, they, for them, they really, you know, they might say, oh, that's great, and pat us on the back, and oh, that's so cool, they're making an empowering TV show. They don't care. Uh, they, you know, right now, we're taking up time that they could be showing a soap opera or singing competition or just airing ads for that. Um, so it was a really big struggle working with a TV channel to keep the educational messaging in and to make it so that it wasn't just an infomercial for Samsung and Pepsi and Volkswagen. Um, Can I ask how happy are you, like, honestly, personally? With the show itself? With the final product, because, I mean, I've, I've been involved with a lot of I was in advertising. I've been a lot of involved with a lot of projects that started out with a lot of integrity, and then they get like chipped away, and then the celebrity. I know exactly what you're talking about, and I wonder when you see the trailer or when you see an episode, how yeah. do you feel about it? So when I see the trailer, I'd say I'm like six out of ten because I don't think the trailer talks as much about like the trailer just meant to get it's people interested. It's a little sensational, interested. right? Yes, yes. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a lot sensational. Yes. Yeah. Um, the show itself, I'm I'm about seven and a half, eight out of ten. Satisfied. The show really actually does a good job mm -hmm. of sort of subtly and non-subtly talking about the issues around entrepreneurship in Egypt, talking about the issues of, you know, it even talks about like social class dynamics mm -hmm. and um, it really does have teaching <coughs> and learning moments mm -hmm. and really is beneficial for the people on the show. There really are people who are watching the show and saying that's a cool thing, I want to get involved. I didn't know that the Social Fund for Development existed, where I can go get a loan, I do now. I didn't know that the One Stop Shop existed, I can go register my business. Um, and also just creating a space for people to have dialogue about this, and even to criticize us if they want. Um, so I'm, I'm actually quite happy. I think the show could be cooler in the future. Um, it, I mean, making a TV show is really hard. Um, so yeah, I, I'm pretty I'm pretty satisfied, but there's definitely room for improvement. Um, yeah, season one. And we also do, one of the big things is that we want to continue this narrative that the people on the show don't just drop off the face of the earth. So when someone gets voted off the next day, we have Google Hangout, where anyone who wants can come have an hour-long discussion with them online. Oh, that's cool. Um, and those have been pretty fun. Um, that was also part of Google giving us money, though. So. <laughs> Or actually, they didn't even give us money. They just they Google's gotten really really cool stuff with us, and that the banner on Google on YouTube Egypt uh, for the past like few days has been our our TV show and pushing a lot of our content. So it's nice to have a partner who runs the internet. Um, so there we didn't charge them, but we, we, we did some nice stuff. Write that down. <laughs> yeah. Nice to have a partner um, that runs the internet. I can tell you some of the struggles as well. People. We, one of the things, too, is that there, we did encounter some people who were really pissed off at us mm -hmm. um, for being there doing a TV show. Yeah. <coughs> um, our staff there, you know, Bambi and Media, we're a core staff of about five people. Um, it's me, Anna Elliott, who's the founder, um, Asim Hanif, who's an extremely talented producer and documentary filmmaker who worked for uh, The Stream for Al Jazeera mm -hmm. for a while, um, who's British of uh, Indian descent. Marwa Moaz, uh, yeah, and that's pretty good. Oh, yeah, Marwa Moaz, who's Egyptian American. Uh, she grew up in Queens, but she lives in Egypt now. Extremely talented at getting shit done. And uh, David Elliott, who's Anna's <coughs> dad, um, actually, who technically Anna's his boss. Um, and he has a lot of experience as an entrepreneur. He was here during the dot com uh, bubble burst. Uh, he worked in Afghanistan for about six years. Um, so there is this foreign staff. There, but at the same time, for El Mashrua, we employed about 20 local staff. 
um, and they're the people doing the local outreach, uh, setting up. You know, we have these. View, we took over the biggest cafe district <coughs> in Cairo, um, which is the equivalent of like Union Square, um, and got all the cafe owners to play our show and give reduced price coffee and all that kind of stuff. Um, so all the people doing outreach, mo all the production staff, all the directors, all that kind of stuff. So it is a very you know show made by Egyptians. Um, we just happen to have the startup money to do it. With that said, like you know, you, like I said, USAID was a huge target on our back. It wasn't like we were necessarily at risk of getting our office raided, like other USAID NGOs were. But there definitely was some, you know, amongst le less, uh, I don't know the word. There's some people who didn't like us because we were operating there and because we were from USAID or maybe just because we rubbed them the wrong way. In truth, most of the people, the reason they didn't like us is because they said that they'd had this idea before and that we had stolen it and, you know, screw you guys. What we would say, what we say to them is what I'd say to a lot of people is like, you know, this is a cool idea, but it's not exactly like revolutionary. You know, The Apprentice exists, Shark Tank exists, um, and the idea of making it educational isn't that crazy, I mean, and so the key just comes down to, well, if you had this idea, maybe you should have done it. Um, and at the same time, we, we always said the door is open. If you want to collaborate with us on the show, if you have ideas and nuances you want to bring to it, if you want to even figure out a way to make some profit off of us, let's do it. And we would just sort of be met with growls and pouts and screw you guys and we're gonna, you know, out you as spies and all that kind of stuff. For the most part, the ecosystem in, in Egypt was hugely helpful, hugely supportive, got what we were trying to do. Um, but there were definitely a few people there that you know were very hostile, or still hostile, um, towards us. You know, saying that we had ulterior motives or that we were trying to push out um, Egyptians that were trying to do this already, um, saying that we were trying to take over the entrepreneurship sector. Etc. And my concessions, I know myself and my staff, and that that is absolutely not what we were trying to do. And that when it, you know we tried as much as we could to, you know, we weren't trying to replace anyone in the sector. We were trying to promote whoever was there and drive traffic. And there was no TV show, and we made a TV show. So. And so, what next? What next? Uh, so for Bamian, we have. Yeah, so it's this moment of the show's airing, and this is actually the calm period for us. The storm <laughs> was production, yeah. um, and the run-up to debuting the show. Um, I, this is the first TV show I'd actually ever worked on, and so I didn't know how much of a mess a just complete you know, cluster making a TV show is. So mm -hmm. now we get to sit back and watch the show. But we, so right now we have money to do um, preliminary studies on the feasibility of doing the show in Yemen, Tunisia, and Somaliland. Um, I'm currently not in Yemen, Tunisia, or Somaliland um, because I don't want to live in Yemen or, or uh, Somaliland. I'd like to, I'd be willing to go back to Tunisia. But so basically, we have funding to check that stuff out. Um, there's an organization called Silatec who's uh, associated who's from Qatar, um, which also causes headaches for us in Egypt. Um, they're a branch of the Qatar Foundation. They do really amazing work around uh, youth employment, entrepreneurship, empowerment. I encourage you all to check them out online. They do a lot of stuff, and they have, the Qataris have a lot of money to throw around um, at stuff like this. Uh, so we, as it stands, we've done the initial trips to talk to, you know, big sponsors in Tunisia, the big TV channels, um, the ecosystem, universities, people on the ground. Um, and we've done the same in Yemen. We're going to be doing it in Somaliland soon. And sort of we're going to go from there and see which of these countries seems the most viable and what's the capacity that we need to do it. You know, we blew through a lot of money that we didn't need to in Egypt. Um, we were highly inefficient at points because this is the first place where we really were doing this big a production. Um, and so the hope is that everything will be way, 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 way more streamlined in, in sort of designing how it gets done in the next countries that we go to. Um, that might mean hiring, you know, figuring out how many local staff to hire, uh, just figuring out timing and stuff like that. 
Um, so those are the next places we might be doing it. Currently, I'm here because I'm, well, one, I've been in Cairo for three and a half years, and I want to be a young American in America. Um, I moved there a month after I graduated. Um, and now I'm sort of scoping out potentially doing the show in South America, um, and particularly in Brazil and Colombia. Um, I've lived in Colombia before, my father's Colombian, I have more connections there. But then Brazil, at the same time, is a huge market, emerging, brick state, World Cup, Olympics, all of that, it's booming. But at the same, so, so what I'm doing right now is doing the same sort of scoping out process, trying to get the connection to the TV channels, trying to talk to ecosystem partners, trying to do the research on what needs to be addressed. And to me, the show in Colombia and Brazil will actually have a little different feel to it, in that Egypt, the idea, because of the way its economy is set up for a while, and because of the, what the status entrepreneurship has there, it was much more of a pure entrepreneurship, to start a business, right? Any, any business you want to do, go for it, do it. Mm -hmm. Colombia, Brazil, their entrepreneurship sectors are a little more developed. Um, and just, just by, it's the way it is. And they also, you know, they're not in the same sort of economic crisis that Egypt is in. You know, Colombia has a GDP rising greatly. Brazil has been this sort of darling of the developing world, you know, securing contracts for these big events, you know, GDP rising. But then when you look at the Gini coefficients, you guys, Gini co okay, um, you know, wealth disparity, stuff like that, these countries rate horribly. Um, U.S. isn't doing great right now, but um, they, and so to me the show will be much more about the idea of sustainable business practices and the idea of triple bottom lines with people applying a profit because I think there the ethos of, you know, go out, start a business, be an entrepreneur is at least somewhat more developed. Um, and so, and, and because the countries are somewhat booming economically, it's important to discuss this fact that it's not trickling down and that it, the money's staying at the top. And so to me, if I end up doing the show in Brazil or Colombia, it would there'd be a very strong narrative about that. And I'd want to work it in in a way that's not saying like, you know, we need to, you know, be Jacobins and slit the throats of all the rich people, because that's not what I'm saying. But, you know, how can we make an inclusive, you know, economy? How can we make it so that when you're starting a business, you're not, you know, paying your employees a good amount and, you know, caring about the uh, environmental impact of your business isn't something that, you know, if you do a decent job at it, everyone just gives you a pat on the back and says you're a green business. I want that to be something that is embedded within all business and that it sort of becomes a no-brainer when you're going out to start a new business. No, you can't exploit your workers. You, you know can't just go get scab workers and you can't just, you know, pollute the rivers. And I and so I want the show to take on that narrative of this isn't something that you should feel special about. I want the contestants to actually be judged on their ability to do these things. Should be the case in the US as well. Yeah. <laughs> You said that you did a social media campaign and now have 500,000 Facebook followers. How did you do that? Um, <laughs> yeah, um, it, it, was, it was interesting. So we did it. Can you show up? Can you call up like the, the Facebook, Facebook page? page yeah, sure. Like so the way we did it is twofold. So we looked at where the majority of the people that, uh, I can show you guys the music video I made too. Uh, <laughs> you guys might like that. Um, what does a mushroom mean? It means project. The, pro the project. So the, th the three is a sort of, it's what they call Franco Arabic, it's transliterated, it's like a hollow A. Mm -hmm. I don't know ah. how to fully. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so this is our Facebook page. So this is Fadwa, who got voted off last time. Um, got a big banner over her face. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that's because you, you, know, you don't like the page yet, or you're not yeah. logged in. Um, <laughs> our sponsors, Samsung, our donors, Silatech, all our other social media info, all that good stuff. We're there, so we're partnering with this entrepreneurship camp in the Sinai, um, pushing some content, all of that kind of stuff. Um, 
So we really said in Egypt, the, the people we're trying to target, there's way more people on Facebook than Twitter. Um, so right off the bat, we said we want to focus on Facebook. Um, huge, huge interaction level, all that kind of stuff. In terms of how we got the numbers, it was twofold. Um, we really had to look at what people wanted, what sort of content would attract people, would get clicks, would be useful to people. And that ranged from everything from, you know, whenever we made a new video for YouTube for to preview the show or just about anything related to the show, increased us exponentially. Um, people really liked inspirational quotes, which I found really corny, <laughs> but people generally just like really were gung-ho about. Um, and so we did a lot of stuff like that. Mm -hmm. We So there's this group, uh, one of the biggest things uh, in terms of content that people liked was from this group called Founders and Funders. Um, and they sort of made this book of infographics about entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurs. And we were responsible for Arabizing and taking those and putting them in Arabic. So we did that every time you know they'd get like 300 shares and all that kind of stuff. And then, to be honest, one of the biggest ways we did it is Facebook ads. Um, and so we hired a social media firm and they allotted out, you know, saying you guys should spend this X amount per month and target this demographic in these places, have these kind of ads, the ads should say this kind of stuff. And people would say, you know, hey, are you interested? You know, it's the stuff you see on Facebook all the time. Hey, are you interested in this? And I guess, and it really did create a lot of uh, followers. Uh, how much <coughs> How much did that cost? <laughs> uh, no, it cost me. No, it's a good question. I'll tell you what it actually we spent, pays no, because it's like, like shamelessly yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. acquired users. Yeah, yeah, no. We, we, we spent we spent a thousand dollars a month on Facebook ads. That's well worth it. Yeah. Yeah, it's not that bad, right? Yeah. yeah. That's affordable. Like we could do that for our project. Let's do it. Let's, Let's do, do that. that. I'm, no, I'm telling you, it works. What I will say is, no, they've done it. Don't not to like. It, it works really well, <laughs> but no, in no. Egypt, the numbers have been done that it is cheaper, in that people are way more inclined to click, I like this, than we are, or that people are in the States. Like, I know personally, like I would never click on a TV show's thing on Facebook to follow them, or a brand, or something like that. There, from what, I, from what we saw, it's a much more common thing, and much more just kind of like, Something that people do. I think the only people I follow on Facebook are like my friends and DMX because he's really funny. Um, <laughs> but so yeah, so that was basically how we drove the traffic. Um, we did new videos. One of the things I'm proudest about is we did a music video. Um, there's a new type of music called shab like electro shabby, um, in Egypt. That when like you're going through the streets, every young young person from a car or a scooter or anything is blasting it. Like it's, it, I don't know who the, the equivalent would be here right now, I've been outside. So, uh, yeah, so, watch it. Yeah. so wait, uh, why did you do this video though? Was it a contention? So basically what we, we did is, so I know their manager and I said, you know, the people who listen to this are the exact demographic mm -hmm. that we want to address the TV show. Mm -hmm. Particularly, you know, it, it's a little male heavy, but you know, lower class, often disenfranchised, um, young guys. Um, to generalize, you often have, you know, spend a lot of their day hanging out at night and driving around and blasting this music at 10 a.m. Um, when I'm hungover and trying to go to work. Um, and so these guy is really popular. His name is DJ Figo. Um, and his partner, Amr Haha, are, yeah, basically the biggest rappers in Egypt right now. Um, and they also were really interesting that they came completely from a non-traditional model. You know, usually it's guys like Tamar Hosni and Amr Diab, but it's very polished, clean-cut, Ricky Martin-looking mm -hmm. dudes. Um, and these guys are very much, they're from Dar es Salaam, which is a giant slum that was basically created after the earthquake in 92. Um, and now they're great. They throw amazing parties and all this. So I basically said, hey, would you guys want to make a song about chasing your dreams and entrepreneurship and wow. all that kind of stuff. So it's also a little, it's also a little bit corny. I'm gonna warn you, it's the, the sound of the music's really abrasive. Okay. <laughs> um, we don't have much but as you can see, like we got um, 
when we tried to market the TV show afterwards is a huge split between what we wanted to do and what the TV channel wanted to do in terms of garnering attention. Oh, I um, TV channel wanted to do it completely, you know, by the book, traditional model. They wanted each a billboard with all the celebrities that were on the show <laughs> there. And so, you know, just their channel name, nothing about like that this show's about entrepreneurs or anything. <laughs> And so we at least got them to not do that. Um, they did end up just putting up a billboard that like just had our logo and didn't even have our catchphrase um, and didn't really say it. They even said the wrong, the show debuted December 2013, just had a big 2014 in letters. Uh, and they just started putting these all over town. Um, they, I did a radio ad that they turned down where I got one of the biggest comedians in Egypt who's a friend of mine to do basically a fake radio period of a call-in show where someone says like, hey, what's up, like, I have a great idea for business, but everyone calls me an idiot. And he's like, oh, you're not an idiot. In fact, there's a new TV show, it's called El Mashro. You should watch it. Um, <laughs> and they turned that down and yelled at me. <laughs> so there was, you know, I feel like there was a lot that we could still do um, if they gave us more leeway in terms of, I hate to use the term, but virality and, um, just really doing stuff that is more appealing to our target audience versus a lot of the advertisers there and a lot of the channels, they still have this aspirational sense of advertising that they want everything to appear as if, as if it's for rich people. Mm -hmm. Because their thinking is like, well, you know, like poor people, why would they want something that's for poor people? And for us, we're like, you guys aren't getting the point. The point is that like we want something, not saying like, you're, we, we want something that people like. <laughs> Um, and this isn't something that just poor people, everyone likes this now, like they sell, they can they're, relate they're, to. well their rival rappers sell like processed meats now, and stuff like that, so, uh, so yeah, the, the campaign was an interesting time of butting heads. And has that, um, has your way proven out to the, I mean, I think this, I think any? this worked really well, um, and it's something that they definitely would have stomped out. And what have you got a response from the TV? I stopped talking to them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not. I'm not in Egypt anymore. I'm so, so is there so. going to be a season two? It sounds like. No. I think no, no. I think there oh, will okay, be a season. Okay. No. So with all the bad mouthing I've done, yeah. um, <laughs> I do think there will be a season two. Um, whether, and our goal is actually right now we're on a channel called Amahar, which is the third biggest channel in Egypt, depending on whether you trust like Nielsen or Ipsos, and that and also those organizations. 
tend to, you know, favor certain people and stuff like that. So the goal is to be on the biggest channel in Egypt, which is called Al Hayat, um, or NBC, who is uh, the listed broadcast company, just launched a new Egypt-centric channel. Um, then there's a chance to go pan region um, to have people from all sorts of different countries, you know, from Lebanon to Saudi to Tunisia, Akrab, all over. Um, and yeah, so there will be, inshallah, a season two. Um, I, th I think the show, the show is going well. We're getting good views. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to either be on the same channel and get more money out of it so we can get a higher production value um, and be able to sustain ourselves more and rely less on donors. Mm -hmm. It's another thing I'd really like to stop uh, relying on donors because it causes headaches and you spend a lot of time trying to please them. Mm -hmm. Our donors have been great, but it'd be much more fun if we just you know, operated like a normal media production company and you know, we make money off making TV shows. Um, but, so yeah, so we'll hopefully go, there's rumors of other channels trying to make rival shows to ours, which is actually one of our goals. Make like, it, that's another thing, when people came to us saying, I had that idea for a TV show, blah, 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 we'd say, oh, you come, work, come work with us, or go make another TV show. Like, you know, it's, a re you, know, you know, it's better than one reality TV show for social change, it's two reality TV shows for social change. Um, so, that's something that we really hope happens. Um, and, by, you know, competition is good for these things. Um, if there's enough money around, then it helps hone the product and helps hone things, you know, like what creating actual impact and which shows will be able to do that better than others. So I would love it if there were other people doing this. You know, obviously it would make me work harder and prove why Bambi Media is better than whoever our competitor would be. But at the same time, if we're, you know, coming at this from the social impact side, then it absolutely there should be more competition in this field. And so will there be a, a, social, a soap opera spin-off? If you go to our website, actually, um, one of the sh so we have all these ideas for shows we want to do as well. And there's soap opera as like a, a sort of vehicle for yeah, social yeah. messaging and change. It's a pretty tried and true right, right. thing. And so it hasn't happened in Egypt yet. So. Um, domestic abuse of domestic workers has been an issue there, and rights of domestic workers, and so we are thinking of doing a show called Real Maids of Cairo. Um, so that's a, that's a pipe dream for now, that we're still focusing on getting this format good and, good and going. Um, but we'll see, you know, it, and it's definitely, you know, for now, when you go to Damien's website, we say reality TV for, TV for social change, because we don't want to box yourself in to, oh, we're just, we're the people who just do, you know, the knockoff apprentice that's educational. Um, we want to keep ourselves open to exploring, you know, different social issues, different things that you know social change should bring about, different formats. Um, Sixteen of, right now. Uh, <laughs> hey, no, that's you guys have talked about that, right? Yeah, like, yeah. It's, we had a great <laughs> meeting. Yeah, okay. like it's an incredible show. Yeah. Um, and I I think there's totally room for stuff like that, mm -hmm. and so. That's that's definitely something that we want to do. For now, yeah, this is our you know bread and butter. This is what people know us by. This is our calling card. Um, but in the future, I really hope that we expand to do other formats. Good. How are you? Um, if you're going to take this to South America, um, how are you going to like keep it as like its brand? Because this name's Egyptian. Yeah. So there we so we own the project dot com. Um, and so the the, the show in Colombia would be O Proyecto, and in Brazil would be O Proyecto. Um, so and from the research I've done there, it translates over. I have to it, you know I have to email people in the countries before and be like, this doesn't mean some like awful slur, because <laughs> 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 like the word for bus for for like minibus in uh, Colombia means something really vulgar in Portuguese, um, and, and etc. El Metro actually means microbus in Alexandria, so that's another branding thing that they didn't let me do. Um, branding that El Metro is there. So yeah, so for now the project is the working name wherever we do it. If we go to a country and they say, hey, you know, like, this doesn't have the same connotation, or this, you know, it, we don't think this works, then we're totally open to changing it. Okay, one, one last one question. For you personally, mm -hmm. just coming out of college, 
yeah. heading into your real life. <laughs> Okay. Um, I've never gotten so, a real job. Right, I was going to say, you know, what, what, what was your biggest takeaway lesson? From this? Mm -hmm. In terms of how I got a job with Bamian or no, doing no, this? No, just in terms of like where you thought you were going to be, what you thought you were going to be doing, what, what life presented to you. Um, I would say, because I'm also kind of going through that right now, um, mm -hmm. I would say just like keeping a lot of, I use two corny metaphors, but it's like keeping a lot of pots boiling, mm -hmm. you know, it's like I always have and always, you know, when I got out of college, it was just like trying to see, you know, putting it on and seeing which boils over first yeah. and then using that. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, when I was leaving the show, I was supposed to go work for some people called the Social Media Exchange in Beirut. Um, and we had these grand plans of creating an archive of all the hashtags from the Arab Spring. Um, <laughs> and they, then they lost all their money. <laughs> so they, I got an email about a month before I was going to move there saying, Hey, Gabi, we really like you. Uh, we can't pay you. <laughs> so I was sort of back to square one. And, you know, I, I, you know, just keep, the biggest thing is, you know, working, I've, all my jobs have come off sort of my network or just being really persistent and semi-annoying. When I, all the people, many of the people I've hired, it's, you know, I'll interview 10 people and they're all great. Or not all of them are all great. But, but you know, it definitely helps getting an email from someone just to check in and stuff like that. And for me, yeah, just keeping things going, keeping things moving. Um, you know, moving to Cairo was a decision because another NGO that I helped start fit, also failed. Um, and I didn't know what I was doing. And so I moved out to Cairo uh, for a month and ended up getting an internship with Ashoka because I interviewed with them and then they didn't talk to me for a month and I called their phone and said, listen, <laughs> I'm here. Take me. I have a flight back to America in a week. <laughs> you guys should really, you know, get your shit together and <laughs> offer me this internship. And then they did and then uh, they ended up being understaffed and I ended up becoming the head of their media marketing and from there just sort of figuring things out. So yeah, just kind of keeping the wheels turning. So you know when you're on a stationary bicycle, the longer you go, the easier it gets. And then when you slow down, it gets really hard again and you're tired. It's kind of like that. And so I just got I'm constantly trying to keep going. It's exhausting at times, but yeah, and just dive into stuff. Like think, think obviously think things out. Like, you know, don't I, I can't sit here and say, you know, bankrupt yourself on any idea. <laughs> That's not, that's not a good idea, that's not a good plan. But definitely, you know, putting thought into stuff and really going for it, you know, often, you know, if it, even if it's not directly successful, often leads to things that are fun and successful. You know, we almost failed at this TV show numerous times. Mm -hmm. the, you know, the amount of, you know, we had a memorandum of understanding with Vodafone for like seven million Egyptian pounds. And then they switched uh, head of branding and they decided they need to reassess. And we ended up not getting it. Mm. So we, we got back to, you know, we were constantly moving forward, but just like many, many setbacks. You know, it should never take two years to make a TV show in the future. <laughs> so yeah, I'd say as, as a young person operating in this space, it, it's challenging and frustrating at times. Um, and I feel very fortunate, and there's a lot of serendipity. Um, but just sort of being amongst people working around this, you find cool opportunities. And if you're passionate about it and talent, you know, talented helps, but you know, a lot of that, it, there's a lot of talented people. It's, you know, I'm not gonna say intangibles, that separates it, but drive and how much you can get the mission, especially in the social sector, how much you actually can synthesize their mission and be innovative with it. Hey, Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Um, I'm going to send Scott.